Good afternoon. Um, my name is Alexander Meyerhofer. I work as the head of research and development at NICTO.IT. And uh, NICTO.IT is the Austrian registry. And as you can see, or maybe not see, um, we have a new CI. And that is actually the first presentation that anybody does in a new CI. So I hope everything works well with the slide templates. Yay. Took us like two years for new colors. So, but you know how that goes. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to speak about, um, I'm going to speak a little bit about NICTOD18, just in case you don't know us yet. Um, and I have three main topics, two bigger ones and one very small one. Um, first, as we heard before by the presentation of Sarah, eDNS is padding is actually required by privacy. And I got sort of into the funny situation from a hallway discussion at an ITF meeting to actually write that internet draft that became the RFC for um, padding. So I'm going to speak a little bit about motivation history um, and also size considerations. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly about the practical experiments that we did at NICTOD-AT with regards to encrypted DNS and then sort of like the most interesting work that we did recently in that area was that I did a simulation or an attempt to simulate the cost of actually TLS and TCP DNS compared to the cost in hosting the DNS that we currently have. Um, so what does NICTOD AT do? Um, we, are, we are the CCTLD operator of .AT. Um, so we have about 1.3 million domain names, um, unlike 3 million that you guys have. So that's, but, but we are trying to get there. Um, well, we are a small country, so we are, we are, we are doing what we can. Um, besides that, we are also a backend and registry operator for new GTLDs. So we host a couple of, uh, of the German-speaking uh, GTLDs. Um, we operate a um, commercial DNS service that's called R Code Zero. Um, and I put it into a big box, but one small component of our company is an R&D team of four people, of which I am the head of. So Sarah talked a little bit about eDNS padding before and also about the motivation for it. And what I like to say, it's, it's required for privacy. But why exactly? So how do we come to that conclusion? Um, if you look at what, what eDNS, or if you look at what encryption of DNS does, uh, a potential um, attacker or surveyor, or however you may put it, um, by using TLS for HTTP, um, the attacker got removed of the information that they actually wanted to see, namely which websites are you visiting, what uh, information do we actually send and receive over HTTP. So most of the bigger name websites and almost every website where you have to enter some kind of credentials or something like that is using HTTPS. But as, have we, as we've heard before, the DNS as of today is still unencrypted. And if you look at the number of DNS queries that a typical website does, news websites are the worst. So I, I read once that a big news website does about 120 DNS queries, 120. That includes all the commercials and stuff and whatever and trackers and so on. So uh, it's actually quite an interesting, let me put it that way, collateral that always looks, uh, almost looks like if you collide two nuclear particles at the CERN collider, uh, it spreads into all kinds of directions. So even if you use HTTPS, a lot of traffic is going sideways to all kinds of uh, services. And so encryption of the DNS actually removes the direct information exposure of that information. So an attacker that sits like in the network somewhere between you and the recursor or on the recursor, well, that's a different story, um, can't see the, the, the content of the traffic anymore. They can't see which DNS queries and which responses uh, get in and out of your machine. However, there was a talk uh, by Haya Schulman at the ITF meeting 93, uh, and the name was Pretty Bad Privacy Pitfalls of DNS Encryption. And she showed in her research that actually, even if you encrypt the traffic, using various techniques, you can actually sort of like fingerprint the DNS traffic in various ways that allows you to correlate the traffic with the existing clear text information that you have, and then pretty much re-identify you um, as an individual. She also won the Applied Networking Research Prize uh, within the Internet Research, research Task Force. So the, the key information of that is, um, side channel information is key. So um, whenever you do encryption, you remove direct access to the information, 
but you create like an interesting pattern of side channel information. Um, so as I said before, when you open a website on your in your browser, you it's not it's not like you're, you're creating a single DNS request for the for the for the web page itself, but rather your client is very likely to create like a couple of other DNS queries for all that stuff that starts to run uh, on that web page as soon as it's loaded. And that creates uh, a whole stream of queries, a pattern of queries and uh, correlating responses. Yeah, And also it creates a very specific timing um, pattern. Um, and, and if you encrypt that, um, an attacker can still see the size of the queries. And um, surprisingly enough, if you only have the size of the queries and the size of the responses and potentially the timing information, but that's a little bit harder because it differs from client to client, obviously, um, you can use the size of those encrypted queries and go into your big database of well-known patterns that you observed over the last 15 years or so um, and see whether you find a pattern that is identical or very similar to the pattern that you have just observed. And surprisingly, I think that the paper said that in 82% in of the cases, you, they were enabled to like identify the actual pattern um, based on the DNS traffic of a client. Yeah? So it's actually not just a theoretical problem, it's actually there's, there's research work that actually proves that that, that works. And, and um, I would assume that certain organizations have like collected quite a big uh, number of patterns over the last couple of years or centuries even. Um, so, and that even works with a subset of message sizes. So as you can see on the screen, it looks like a key. Yeah, It looks like the, the sawtooth of a key and even if one of the messages is missing for whatever reason, caching or whatever, it's still quite likely that you find a corresponding pattern in the database. So, what does padding do? Padding um, changes the size of the encrypted packets in a way so that the original size of the packet is concealed. In that case, what I've uh, what I've, I've drawn here is that I'm, I, I decide to pad my DNS queries on a certain block size. So whenever a, um, a DNS query is smaller than, let's say, 128 bytes, I pad it to 128. When it's 140 bytes, I pad it to 256 and something like that. And what that does, it does obfuscate the size pattern and it actually hampers correlation because if you go with the padded uh, size pattern into the database of well-known patterns, it's uh, much less likely that you find just one specific pattern, uh, but you find like millions of it. So um, that is one way to reduce the side channel information that um, DNS encryption still leaves to the attacker. Um, it's not perfect, yeah, because it's very hard to influence the timing pattern. So if you know that the timing pattern is like also very significant, um, you can probably mm, correlate the timing pattern with other, with other information that you have as well. But it's removing one of those uh, very important um, side channel sources that a potential attacker has. What does it look like? It's pretty easy. I think the RFC is like six pages or something like that. And the only important thing in that whole RFC is essentially that, uh, that part. So it's like an eDNS option that has just the information about its length and then the padding, which uh, should be filled with zero values. Um, you can, if you're concerned about higher level TLS compression or something like that, optional also use other patterns. But there was a concern that this could be used as a, as a covert channel yeah, between clients and servers. Um, yeah, so the more complicated thing is now, uh, what's the right size to pad? Uh, obviously, some of the padding sizes are out of the question, like zero length padding uh, doesn't give you any, any, any good um, obfuscation of the size. Um, the other one is fixed length. It's also not, not very good because after a single uh, encrypted query and comparing it to the original unencrypted query, you know what the length of this padding is. And um, Daniel uh, K. Chilmore actu actually did um, interesting research work where he used real life traffic from recursive resolvers and padded them artificially, so to say, and simulated um, 
how much cost an attacker would have compared to how much cost uh, a defender would have. So it's more like a teaser chart that I've included here because um, I I'm not gonna explain that into detail. But he has said, if I paired a certain query with that strategy and a certain response with that other strategy, um, how close is that to the perfect situation where each and every DNS query creates just one single pattern? And that perfect situation you could obviously uh, create by padding the DNS query to the absolute maximum limit of the size and by padding the response to the absolute maximum uh, message size. But that's obviously not, not, not uh, uh, very wasteful and creates a lot of additional traffic. Um, so there's actually another internet draft in the Deep Drive Working Group, um, which um, is work in progress and tries to define uh, what the perfect padding policy uh, should be. So if you're interested in that, it's really, it's really interesting research work. Uh, the links are on the slides. Um, and it seems like the currently good strategy is to pad to a certain block of bytes. Yeah, random is always a little bit uh, scary uh, because of the quality of the random source. So block padding seems to be the, the tool of the choice right now. Um, so that's about eDNS zero padding. It's like a small detail um, of the whole encrypted DNS story. But as I said, it's an important one because without that, you can't be sure that the information can be recovered um, to its original unencrypted form. Um, very brief experiments with encrypted DNS. What we did, we set up Stubby, we set up Not Resolver, we played around a little bit with that, so there's nothing really new. Um, other people have talked enough about that. Um, we are not currently running a recursive DNS server, and that's partly because as a registry, we are in the business of authoritative name servers. Um, but we, of course, have an obligation to the DNS community in our country. So we are, we are thinking about that, but we don't have a, a public server running right now. Um, finally, what, what we did recently in our R&D department is uh, I thought about uh, the question, if all the queries that we receive via UDP which would suddenly overnight reach us via TCP and TLS, what would be the cost? So um, how many new, s new servers would we have to add in order to sustain the level of traffic that we had now? Um, and I have to say that since we are um, operators of authoritative servers rather than recursive, we would probably uh, only be hit by that in like five years on or something like that. Since uh, as Sarah said, uh, the focus of the Deep Drive Working Group is uh, currently in fixing the stop resolver to recursor uh, side. But yeah, as I said, the question is, what if 100% of all of the DNS queries would reach us via TCP TLS? And uh, I had the idea to actually simulate that. And so the sort of receipt for that simulation is, first, I would need to do a little bit of assumption about client behavior. So how would a TLS TCP client actually behave? Um, I didn't consider misbehaving clients for the time being, but I'm sure we're gonna see them. Um, and then I add to that information, information about real world packet traces. Um, and I get sort of like a simulated stream of events. Yeah, connects, disconnects, queries, and so on and so forth. And then the most complicated part I found out is estimate the cost of each individual transaction, multiply that with the events that I get, and then I get ex essentially the estimate uh, at best of TLS and TCP costs. So I thought a little bit about what would be the assumptions and rules um, of, of TCP TLS traffic. So my assumption is with regards to sessions and queries and the relation to each other, the first query that I see from an IP address would essentially trigger a setup of a TLS session. Yeah, that's quite obvious because otherwise the query could not be performed. Any subsequent query by that same IP address would actually reuse um, that TLS session. So I'm assuming that they're all good behaving clients, they're not doing the one shot thingy, they're all like opening a session and then using that as long as it goes. Um, 
I'm also assuming that even a very busy client does actually only use one uh, session, which is maybe uh, not the case, but anyways. And I'm assuming that they are all doing the right thing, as we heard before, pipelining, out of order, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, regarding session terminating, I said that there are three reasons to actually terminate the session. Uh, the first is that the session will shut down after a certain number of seconds of idle time, so after no query has been received. Um, a second timeout um, will limit the session length to a maximum. So I'm saying after like 3,600 seconds in my example, sessions will need to terminate. The server will not allow any longer sessions. And the third uh, reason for termination I thought would be um, after a certain number of queries, a session would need to shut down and restart for whatever reason, memory leaks, I don't know. Um, and if you look at the chart above, so I'm, I'm, I'm having the UDP query stream that we receive on our servers, and I'm, I wrote a script that actually translates that into um, the TLS session event, in a way. So the first packet creates a session setup of client A, and then client A sends a couple more packets. Um, after some time, it reaches the idle timeout and the TLS session will shut down. Um, then he sends another packet like a couple minutes later, so a new TLS session will be started. And I have a second client in pink that does a couple of queries and then also runs into the idle timeout. Um, yeah, I've essentially explained it already. Wow. So what, what type of events do I get out of this? I get uh, session setup, obviously. I get session teardown for three reasons. Timeout, maximum duration of the session, maximum number of queries. Um, I obviously have the same queries and responses, so my assumption is that doesn't change anything. And I also get the number of concurrent sessions that I have at a specific point in time. Um, I can, for those active sessions, or for those established sessions, I can look how many of them did actually send a query in the last second or so. Um, what is the average session duration? And um, yeah, a couple of other things, like the, number of av the average number of queries per session and so on and so forth. And so what's our input data? Um, I used a packet trace from a .at name server from one of our busier ones. It's, that's the first caveat. It's actually authoritative queries. So um, one would need to rerun that simulation on re re recursive information, and I'm working on that. But currently, I'm running in on authoritative data. Um, it's a single server. I think it's actually a local Anycast, so it's a couple of nodes. Um, it's about 78 million queries. It's 24 hours. Um, so that gives about 1,000 queries per second with a peak. Largest peak is 11,000 queries per second. And I've reduced the uh, information to IPv4 UDP only because TCP is still an exception, sort of. And yeah, looking a little bit closer at the traffic properties, it's pretty much a normal day. So that's what a normal day without any DDoS attacks, um, without any weird things looks like under .at. And it constitutes about 7% of all traffic. So we receive between 15,000 and 20,000 queries per second. So the first interesting thing, how many new TLS sessions do I see per second? Um, and there is obviously a peak in the first second because that's when I started my simulation. That's about 700 or something like that. And then it like um, goes to a level of about 200 per second. So it's not that bad. It's something that any normal server would easily handle. Um, you can also see the parameters that I choose for that uh, simulation. I choose an idle timeout of 60 seconds, um, which is probably a little bit high, but more to that later. I chose a maximum duration of the session of an hour and maximum number of queries 10,000. Yeah? And the funny thing is you see those spikes of session setups each and every hour at the beginning. Um, at first I thought that was due to the reason that I started the simulation on the full hour. But the more interesting thing is that there are lots of weird clients out there that actually um, do queries at the full hour and then shut down and do nothing. So it's like some kind of monitoring spike of somebody else. So those spikes are not just my simulation start it and the 3,600 uh, second session timeout. It's some real world behavior that's happening out there. Um, so compared to the queries of second, uh, it, it means that for every fifth query approximately, we see a new TLS setup. Yeah, it's quite quite interesting. Um, 
as I said before, using that simulation, I can also identify how many of those sessions have actually done at least one query uh, in the previous second. Yeah. So, and that turns out the relation between active and established uh, sessions is pretty low. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you can see the the light blue is the number of established sessions, and the dark blue at the bottom is the average number of active sessions within that time period. So about 95% of the sessions are actually idle, yeah, with the 60 seconds idle timeout. And um, I said that there are three reasons for shutting down a session. So I looked a little bit into that with, with uh, I looked a little bit into the detail of that. Um, I, I also found out there's a, there's a problem with the figures over there, but um, no price for the first spotter. Um, almost all of the sessions were tiered down because the client ran into the idle timeout. So we have lots of clients that only do like a few queries and then they do nothing for some time and then they shut down again. Remember, we're an authoritative server, so that surprised me a little bit. I would have thought for a recursor, yeah, well, for my mobile phone I do is like three queries and then I do nothing for an hour, but even on the authoritative side it's that way. Um, only 0.12% of those sessions actually reached the idle timeout, uh, the maximum duration of an hour. And even less, uh, yeah, a few, I'm an engineer, I'm not a scientist, so I'm seeing a few, uh, reached the number of maximum queries. And if you look at those clients a little bit closer, you find out that those are the clients, they are like doing A to Z queries for all domain names they know. Yeah, it's not, it's a little bit artificial traffic. Um, and I started to look at what, what are the properties of the sessions that ran into the idle timeout. Um, how many of those are short sessions? And by short session, sessions, I defined that the total session length, including the idle time, is less than two times the idle time. So then less half of the time of the idle time, the client did something. So in that case, session, two minutes, um, active time, first 60 seconds, it's a short session. Um, and about 90, 91% of those clients were short sessions. And even worse, if you look at how many of the sessions actually did just something in the first three seconds and then they idled around for 60 seconds, um, it's 77%. So many of the clients are still doing bursts and then nothing for a while. Um, the average number of queries, it's not that interesting because the histogram looks quite crazy. I didn't plot it, but the average number is 33. So um, but there are clients with, with lots of queries and many, many queries are clients with very few queries. Um, so obviously the, the idle timeout has the biggest impact. Yeah. So many of the clients are idling around and I looked at the, at varying the idle timeout. I went from five seconds over 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 60, 120 to 300 seconds. Um, and Quite frankly, the biggest impact it has is on the number of established sessions. Um, so for five seconds, we have about 4,000 sessions. For 300 seconds idle timeout, we nearly have 50,000, more than 50,000 sessions. All those charts are like maximum, median, minimum. Yeah. So uh, it all depends. Yeah. Regarding session setup per second, it's actually not that bad. I thought it would be worse. So on average, using a session idle timeout of five seconds gives you like um, 360 session setups per second. So only like double the number than a 60 second idle timeout would, would, would do. So it's not that bad. Um, and the active session ratio of course goes up the lower the idle timeout is. So with a five, sec five second idle timeout, nearly 25% of the sessions are actually doing something in a certain second, yeah. Um, so it looks like, from my perspective, that lower idle timeouts are actually to be preferred. I believe that in reality, clients will probably fall into different categories. So the recurse of a big ISP will probably have a long living session, um, while a client that directly queries us will probably have a very low idle timeout. Um, and the interesting question now is we, in that case, we obviously we trade the number of established sessions versus the number of session setups. Another question is where's the sweet spot? Where's the cost in terms of operational capacity um, lowest 
for the combination of an idle timeout and the combination of sessions and setups. Um, so there's a big warning sign on that slide because that is all guesstimation. Yeah? Um, I tried very hard to find precise figures on what's the cost of a TLS setup, and the answer is always, it depends. So um, I, I, I used two figures, one where uh, from the Nginx people, they had performance tuning and uh, performance measurement uh, figures. So essentially, it's a server buying guide. They say, if you have 3,000 TLS setups per second, we recommend you to buy a eight core, four gigabyte, blah, whatever server. Um, so, a couple of estimations, and I tried to break them down and say what's the cost in parts per million of a server of a certain transaction. So, for example, I'm saying a server that we have can do about 600,000 uh, packets, <laughs> packets per second. Modern servers can probably do more than that, but that's the cost I assumed. So, I'm saying a query and a response has obviously, in most cases, yeah, two packets. So that is 3.3 .3 parts per million of that server capacity. And the same goes for the other um, events. TCP TLS setup, I'm assuming now six packets, uh, which should be quite close to the currently achievable minimum already. Um, the TLS folks uh, can happily correct me. So that is very easy to calculate. It uh, costs about 10 parts per million of a server. And the teardown, I'm saying it's like a normal TCP teardown, it's three packets, so it's five parts per million. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated regarding CPU and I.O. Um, because there where the figures are hard to get and benchmarks are helpful, but um, they're all ending up in it depends. So I'm saying uh, in terms of CPU, uh, a reasonable server can do about 200K queries per second. So I'm saying a query costs five ppm of the CPU resources. A TLS setup, that's what the Nginx people say on a reasonable server, they can do 3,300 per second. So I'm saying uh, a single setup costs 300 parts per million. Session teardown, that's a wild guess, no figures anywhere. I'm saying it costs maybe a little bit more than a query and a response because you have to update all kind of state information in your kernel and whatever. So I'm saying 20, yeah. And finally, memory, that's also something where figures are hard to get for. I'm saying we keep two gigabytes of memory for the TLS state information. And people from a SSL library that I didn't know before, Wolf SSL, they say they need between one and 35 kilobytes per TLS connection for the state, and they say on average is three kilobytes. So fair enough, I'm saying three kilobytes gives me 1.5 parts per million. Um, now I'm doing a little bit unfair calculation because a typical server can do the 600k packets per second and maybe still has some TPU resources left. But for the time being, I'm like simply adding up everything for an individual transaction and I get to a cost of a transaction. Um, and that it is, yay. So on top is the cost in terms of parts per million of a server for UDP as we see it. And that's pretty much in line with what we actually see in load on those servers. And the bottom chart is, uh, it's the same scale, obviously. Um, the bottom chart is the cost in parts per million of a server for TLS. And I was surprised to see the maximum cost is about 250,000. So it's about 25% of the server. Um, but that's because all the authoritative DNS operators, they like to over provision their DNS servers for at least two magnitudes. So that's what you also see. We see like 1%, 2%, 3% load on our machines under normal um, environmental conditions, let me put it that way. And as soon as you have an attack, we like max out to 80%, 90%. Which means that we could actually perfectly run the TCP TLS traffic, famous last words, on our existing hardware, but we would have uh, not enough room for headroom for attacks and um, other funny situations anymore. But actually coming back to that, um, it surprised me that it seems to be reasonably cheap. Of course, you can vary the numbers. So for example, if you say the TLS session costs you 50 kilobytes memory and not just three, then the figures look probably completely different. Um, coming back to the question, what's the perfect idle timeout? What's the trade-off between session setup and um, number of concurrent sessions? Um, yeah, well, one step back. What's the magic number? 
So how many, how many more servers do I need if all my traffic comes in via TCP TLS? It's eight, approximately, yeah, for a 60 second idle timeout, which is a little bit lower than I expected. I would have thought something like 20 or so, but, um, and it's also pretty stable over the whole day. So the chart on the left is the comparison of the cost of TLS, TCP versus UDP. As expected, the first second is of course different because we have all the session setups yeah, in one second, um, but it's also not that bad. I think it's 25 or something. Yeah, and the cost ratio versus idle timeout, it gets cheaper the longer the idle timeout is, which means that the session setup costs are still predominant. Yeah, I didn't rerun the simulation with, let's set the session costs um, to 30 kilobytes instead of three kilobytes. I believe it would look differently then, but um, yeah. As I said before, the guesstimate sign is missing here. All of those cost values that I have are actually just um, wild guesses. Yeah. Um, so summary about the three topics that I discussed today, EDNS padding required for privacy. There's an RSC for the padding. It's implemented as Sarah mentioned before and size recommendations uh, to what size should I pad are currently in progress. Yeah, our DNS TLS experiments are pretty like me. Yeah, we haven't done anything that anybody else hasn't done yet. And the cost simulation on the other hand is something new. The magic number for an operator, it's roughly eight for authoritative traffic. We need to look into recursive. And of course it depends, TLS optimizations, um, rogue clients I would say. Yeah, it's very easy to open up a couple of hundred sessions just instead of one. Um, and the cost assumptions change maybe on, we, we, we probably would need to do some benchmarking to actually get actual cost figures. Um, you know, future work in that area, we need to do better simulation. For example, I didn't simulate sub-second idle timeouts now. Um, I only went for the full second. Um, and more precise cost factor estimation. And what I have forgotten here is, we really want to try that on recursive data because that's the more pressing problem because the recursive servers will have to go for TLS first after the authoritative servers will. So that's it. <laughs> Thanks everyone. I'm open for questions. <laughs> There's another one, yeah. Okay, last question. Okay, so do you have some questions? Yes. Thank you for, for your presentation. Um, considering that TLS 1.3 will ship with its own padding mechanism with your records, uh, would you rather invest in the EDNS zero padding or the TLS padding or both? That's an interesting question. And it dates back to the ITF in Prague where Daniel actually proposed TLS padding, oh, padding on the TLS layer to the TLS people. Yeah, and the TLS people in the TLS working group said, no, padding should be closer to the application so that the application actually knows uh, which padding strategy is going on. And the only thing they agreed on is that TLS compression should not be used. Yeah. So that's the situation that we got. And actually that was the reason why I wrote the, f wrote the draft in the first place. So the current view of the TLS working group within the ITF is that padding should be as close to the application as possible. I think Sarah had a question. Um, thank you, this is great work, I love it. Um, one, quick, one quick question about your data. What was the number of clients you had in that data set? I don't know. Okay, so I'll ask you afterwards then. <laughs> um, I can find out. <laughs> I, I find it really interesting because I think... Yeah. Well, we had about 14.5 million sessions, but that includes repeating clients. Because I'm thinking one of the big differences, obviously, between authoritative and recursive is yeah. that a recursive can have yeah. tens of thousands of, of clients. Um, I think the data is interesting because I think in your numbers, using the six packets for the setup, you've kind of taken the worst case scenario. Um, so you're not looking at session resumption, fast open, uh, TLS 1.3, you know, 
features like that. So, what, yeah. So I mean, that was my question to Max asked before. Uh, yeah. So I, I need to understand the right number. So, <laughs> so I think they can only get better in terms of the cost to the setup. Um, I'm also interested because I know historically people always said that just doing TCP would take an order of magnitude more resources than doing UDP, and you've shown you know, ballpark figures that TLS, which again was a thought to be an order of magnitude more expensive, isn't that bad. So that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a bit of a back of an envelope com um, calculation, but I think it's encouraging. Um, I actually looked into figures on what's the CPU intensity of a TLS setup compared to a TCP setup. Yeah. And the problem is I couldn't find any numbers. The only numbers that I thought, uh, found was um, what's the cost in terms of battery micro ampere hours on a mobile phone to load a web page over TLS versus HTTP. But in that case, the dominant uh, power drencher is JavaScript and blah, 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 and rendering <laughs> of images. So, right, yeah. um, if, if you're interested in tools to try and do benchmarking on this, I think we're not too far away from having them. So Very cool. what would be great is to do those experiments and then compare it to, to your numbers and see how closely they align. Well, I mean, so to, so to say that the, the, the final step, of course, would be to create a tool that actually reruns the traffic that we receive mm -hmm. um, in a simulated, uh, not a simulation, but in actual in, in, uh, empiric experiment against a single server. Yeah. Uh, with all the optimized software that we have. I, I thought about maybe talking to DNS or CEO regarding that. So I think their drool tool but combined Jerry's pretty busy. with, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think if you could combine that with um, possibly some other tools that would do the TLS part for you, proxying through that, I think you could get pretty close. Um, and the last comment was, um, I think it is interesting, you were talking about how to build in attack mitigation into this data, and I think um, when you come to talk about defending against attacks on TLS, you're in quite a different say situation to defending against attacks over UDP. So that could be a particularly challenging part to model um, and get this right. So um, um, I, I don't know I how mean, much you've thought about that. You're right. And the, 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 the reason why I actually chose a normal day without any significant attacks, I mean, yeah, we have like, we are constantly under attack, as uh, a colleague from Cloudflare put it, um, was that I wanted to like simulate the nice, normal, let's go for a coffee, oh, it's 11 already, um, situation, not a situation in which we uh, have to deal with rogue clients. I mean, a client that creates a TLS session and leaves it open yep. and then does nothing, and hundreds, thousands of those, yep. they would truly have a different impact than um, hundreds of thousands of identical clients doing UDP. You I know, so I th yeah, I think because you've got source port, uh, sorry, uh, source IP identification in TCP, your defense mechanisms are different, and I think the types of attacks you'll have to defend will be different as well. Yeah. So I don't think it will be that useful to model it on your UDP data necessarily. It would probably um, be something like the mirroring in the first place, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, I, I, I have one question, don't, don't, don't leave. <laughs> you, you talk about uh, the registries, but for the customer, does it introduce some delays in the for resolving names? or? Um, I didn't do any time simulations yet. I, I, I thought about doing it like delaying the first query by blah, but then I can't really do that because I don't understand the relation between queries, Yeah, because mm -hmm. we're looking at the authoritative side. It would be more interesting on a recursive side, and also what we didn't simulate was uh, TLS session resumption. Yeah. So, was very simple for now. Yeah. No, it was a very but interesting study. I'm going to invest some more work into that, <laughs> and yeah, gonna keep you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>